Welcome to the Big Deal Real Estate Podcast, where we talk about things pertaining to Vancouver real estate, its suburbs, and business in general. We also like to bring on people who are kind of a big deal from time to time. I'm your co-host, That Agent Kelly, here with Jarrett White, aka That Guy That Does Mortgages. If you watch this on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. If you're watching on Spotify, do all the same. Our guest today, somewhat of a idol slash mentor to me i would say been watching his content religiously for five six years most of the stuff that i preach and say is just a bastardized version of what this gentleman says mr owen bigland thank you for coming on thanks very much for having me guys absolutely so i guess do you want to start off by telling the listeners a little bit about yourself sure i um i was pretty much you know born into real estate my father was a realtor started selling real estate in the late 1950s in kitsilano uh, got into the oil business for a brief period of time. We moved to Toronto, grew up in Toronto, and then moved back here in the early 80s and where my father took real estate back up again. He's a bit of a legend in Richmond. He's now retired, but my dad's main market was Richmond uh, when we moved back here from Toronto. What was your dad's name? Leonard Bigland. Leonard. So any realtor that uh, works ri- has worked Richmond over the last 25 or 30 years would know my father for sure. Well, well-established well realtor in Richmond. Did a little bit in Vancouver as well, and then but cut his teeth in Vancouver in the 50s. Um, so that's really the business I pretty much was born into. My dad's uh, brothers were all real estate investors. Um, did some building, um, uh, but uh, the philosophy I always taught was taught with my dad is you know buy and hold real estate, good things will happen. And uh, I became licensed, I guess, about 14 years ago now. Uh, my main market is, would be Vancouver, downtown condos, east side, west side, detached, but work a little bit in areas like still work a little bit in Richmond and Burnaby and New Westminster. Um, I don't know. I don't like to get into too much other things than that. I mean, top top producer. Uh, at McDonald Realty for the past four years. This will be five years coming up. Medallion Club uh, for quite a while as well. Top, so you top are 10. obviously exposed to like just the whole idea of real estate like from very early on, right? Yeah. From your family? Absolutely. My yeah. dad uh, taught my brother and I the value of, of buying our first property, not renting very long or trying not to rent very long, save your money, get into a, a condo. He always used to use the analogy, you know, you start with a Motel 6, uh, forget about trying to buy a Four Seasons or a Ritz-Carlton, start with a Motel 6, live in it, stay in it. If you can, keep saving your money, rent that one out and buy something bigger and better until you do move up to a Four Seasons. And that's what we've always been taught. You know, he always used to tell me about the friction costs of real estate, and, and it's true. Real estate is expensive to buy and sell. So uh, avoid, if you got, especially in Canada and BC with the property transfer tax and GST if it's new and then commissions, you know, yeah. we don't come cheap. And uh, so best thing to do is to buy and try and hold real estate as long as you can. And good things happen, which they do. So when did you first, like, what was your first taste of real estate? When did you, what was your first, like, experience in either investing or, or selling real estate or? Yeah, well, I remember talking as a, as a, you know, in my early teens to my father about real estate, going out to listings that he had, looking at homes on the east side and on the west side that, that he had listed. Uh, I bought my first property uh, at 18 years old. Uh, that was my first property. It was a one bedroom, uh, one bath on Accord Road in, in central Richmond, Brick House neighborhood. Um, and I still own that condo today. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, long, long since paid off. Uh, 30, if I remember correctly, it was about $34,000. <laughs> oh, wow. That, that condo was uh, at the time uh, about three years old, wood frame, uh, second floor with a small parking space. So I lived in that condo for probably about three or four years and then moved up to a townhouse but and then turned that into an investment yeah. unit. And uh, I've renovated it a few times since then, but I still hold it and still no plans on selling it. Really? And it's, uh, it's a clear title property for me, of course. Have yeah. you sold any of your investment real estate? Uh, a few, very little. I've sold a few principal residents only to... to only to qualify for the next Exactly, one. to yeah. move up into something bigger and better. Um, I have sold a few uh, investment units over the years, but it was always to uh, consolidate to buy something else. Right, right. Yeah, but I could count on one hand the amount of less one hand the you just real estate to, that I've sold. You just try to keep everything. Basically. I try to again if so, I can until uh, until I'm at a point where I'm want to cut back. And my wife has been on me for a number of years, but I think maybe when I get into my 60s, then I'll probably mid 60s, maybe I'll reevaluate it and maybe start to downsize a little bit, 
or turned it over to a property manager or something like that. But right. um, but uh, I prefer just hanging on to the so, yeah. hanging on to it. Let the capital gains continue to roll tax free. Yeah. And uh, if you've got tenants in there, they're paying you a nice rent. It's uh, you know it's really the way to go. Yeah. It's a slow way to get wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so obviously right now, like I was looking at this metric the other day, it was like the consumer sentiment, it's called like AAII or something like that. Basically right now, the bearishness of our market is sitting at 58%, which is basically the highest print ever. And we've been sitting there it for, is, hey, for yeah. three weeks. Yeah. There was one week in 2008 where we, where we were at 70% bearish. And oddly enough, that marked the literal bottom of the stock market yep. when we hit 70%. In the 08 crash there, yep. What do you, what mindset do you think investors and uh, home buyers should have going forward right now in this market? Well, I would say I understand the bearishness for sure. It's everywhere you look, it's doom and gloom out there. Interest rates are going up, uh, have gone up quite dramatically here. I think this is about the quickest uh, interest rate hiking we've ever had in this country and in the United States. And we've still got more to go. Um, the stock market is in the doldrums. Worst uh, uh, first half of uh, in the stock market we had in something like forty years. I think it's ever now, or isn't maybe it? ever now. Yeah, because it keeps going down. Yeah. So for sure, pessimism is high. Doom and gloom is out there. I think we're probably, if we're not already, heading into a recession here. Uh, if not, we will be, I think, because that's the only way that we're going to bring int- uh, inflation down yeah. is to put us into a recession. So I, I understand that people are, are, um, are hesitant um, on the buy side. That said, I'm still working with a fair number of buyers, um, principal residents, buyers, as well as some investors. Uh, I've also had some investors take a break for right now, let things kind of settle down a little bit. But um, you know what I would say to a young person, if, they're, if they've got the money for the down payment in place and they're pre-approved, you know, I know it sounds like a realtor, but I would say continue working with your realtor. As long as you've got a good realtor, you're getting good counsel. If the right unit comes up, put an offer in on it. But follow kind of what my golden rules that I've always preached in my book and on my blog, and that is you have a long-term holding period, at least eight to 10 years. You're going to buy that house and you're going to be able to live in it, enjoy it for at least eight to 10 years. Uh, also leave yourself a bit of a buffer. Um, you know, interest rates are probably still going to continue to go up here. So allow for that. Now, what I would say on that front, though, is, you know, you're already hearing economists saying that interest rates, we might have another two or three quarter point hikes or maybe a 50 point basis hike. But don't be surprised if they pivot, the Fed starts pivoting maybe next summer and we start to see interest rates come down again slightly. So I would say to most people, maybe take the advice of your mortgage broker, maybe just lock in a one year or a two year and maybe you'll get a better rate when that comes up for renewal. But I understand the pessimism. I would say if you're a young person, stick with the program. It certainly beats renting. But I also tell people if, if you want to wait a little bit on the sidelines, I just did a blog on it, no problem. But do a few things. Uh, set a, a, a time limit on how long you're going to be on the sidelines because if you don't set a time limit, you're going to wait years and years trying to time a bottom, which you're probably never going to be able to do. And a bottom price. And a bottom price. Set a strike price. Exactly. Set a price. So if, if the condo you're looking at now, you're qualified for 700 if that gets down to 675 or 650 we're going to pull the trigger, provided that the right unit comes yeah. up and everything else makes sense. So set a strike price, set a time limit. Otherwise... You're going to wait forever and wait ever forever. and ever. And I could tell, story, tell you guys stories about, you know, 10 years ago, seeing people coming through my open houses, you know, looking at stuff. It's overpriced. It's way over. I'm waiting for a crash. It's going to happen. And then a year later, you'd see them again. Meanwhile, prices are continuing to eat, go up slightly. <laughs> and then eventually, after about five or six years, you know, you just, they just disappear yeah. because they've been, they've lost the market now. It's gotten so far ahead of them now that... So very difficult to time markets. I never have. I just always systematically bought when I had the down payments and I was pre-approved. And I do the same in the stock market, which works at a way faster pace than the real estate market. Yeah. I'm just systematically buying and I don't worry about trying to time a bottom, but that's how I work. I understand when people want to wait for a better opportunity though as well. Maybe let the few dark clouds get out of the way here. Yeah. Well, if, if you're playing it like you played it, like say it's the first time buyer where you buy into a condo and then you plan to just keep that condo f- like, well, in your, in your sense for forever right now, right? Like 
it's a lot easier to qualify when you're you're jumping from property to property than just strictly buying a rental property on the on the mortgage side of things. Yep. So if you have that outlook that you're going to buy to hold it anyways, yep. then it shouldn't it shouldn't matter if it's it might go down a little bit more because you're risking there, there's more to risk with it bouncing back up than it going down a little bit. More. Agree, hundred percent. I had a guy comment on my on my YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago saying that you know the bottom's going to fall out. We're in a huge crash. It's just beginning, and maybe he's right. I don't know, but. But, you know, he goes, I'm going to wait for a, a better opportunity and I've got time on my side and I can wait indefinitely. And I challenged him on that. I said, well, you can wait, but I don't know about waiting indefinitely. Uh, how long can you wait? The first thing is, is that inflation is running at all time highs here. So your cash sitting in the bank account right now is losing six or seven percent every year. Um, the other thing is, you know, things like mortgage qualifying here in Canada just keep getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Who knows what it's going to be like in a couple more years? Um, and hey, interest rates, they're still well below our historic averages here. Young people now think that four and a half percent, this is getting crazy. And for sure, <laughs> compared to where we were, it was nuts. But this is, I'm an old guy. And, you know, my first condo that I bought when I was 19 years old, I was paying 13 and a half, 14 percent. And I remember my second property was at double digits around 10 and a half, 11. And I remember when interest rates got down to single digits, like eight and a half, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. So <laughs> four and a half right now for an old guy like me is still f pretty favorable. But I understand young people have never known anything above, you know, I think three the and main half. argument that people have towards that is just the, the, the amount you have to borrow now in comparison. And that's why it's so drastic in their mind. Yeah. Um, which it definitely is, does take a big part in it, but... Yeah, you're you're right. Absolutely, the prices have gotten a lot higher than what they were yeah. when when they were at the much higher interest rates. But, but you know, I think that it is that Tina effect. You know, there is no alternative. You know, if you're not owning, you're renting. So you have to factor in. You know, what are you paying for rent right now too? And uh, you know, as we guys know, the rents in the last few years have just gone ballistic here. They've just skyrocketed. Literally doubled in the valley. In some parts yeah, the valley. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I can tell you in Vancouver, you know, a unit that was renting for twenty one hundred in twenty nineteen is probably getting twenty eight, twenty nine hundred now, yeah. three thousand even in some cases. So that is your cost of being on the sidelines. It's you're losing eroding money to inflation, uh, but you know you've also got a you need a roof over your head. So if you're not owning, you're paying. 2800 for a basic one bedroom downtown. So do the math on that's that. Very, that's 35,000 a year if you wait 5 years. I mean that's $250,000 after tax that's to your landlord. It's very risky renting on the west coast, you know. If rent keeps going up, eventually you're going to be paying an under market because your landlord can't raise the rent, yeah. which you think it in like face value it's like, "Well, I'm getting a good deal. I'm paying under market rent." At a certain point, it stops making sense for your landlord to hold that property. Then they sell, and, and then, then you got to go find somewhere else. And all of a sudden, your living expenses have just nearly doubled. Yeah. Right. Whereas at least if you have a mortgage, it's constant. Like that is your payment. I actually know right? a lot of people that just went through that. Same. Detached homes rented for two grand. Now they got they're out of that home. Now they're into their new home. Forty four hundred now. Yeah. Literally doubled. Yeah. yeah. There's been all kinds of stories in the media about people. You know that landlord gave him the call and said, you know, listen, my daughter's going to move into the unit or I'm going to sell the house. You're going to have two months to leave. They've been there for three or four years and now they've got to wade into the current rental market and they're shocked. Which is awful. It there's is. There's nothing available. Prices are very high. Exactly. So I always say that there's nothing wrong with renting short term. If someone moves to Vancouver or the lower mainland here, they're new to the area, nothing wrong with renting for a little while. Get a lay of the land, see where you, where you, what, how you like the city. And then once you've got a commitment that you like it here and you're going to stay, then I would put it a top priority to own as opposed to becoming a long-term renter here. Being a long-term renter on the West Coast and all the West Coast, you know, Seattle, Portland, Southern California, it's incredibly difficult long-term. You're going to really be behind the eight ball financially if you stay there. Yeah. And um, But, you know, the tough part for young people is getting that down payment. Once you've got that down payment in place and you can get qualified, you've crossed a huge financial hurdle in life. Yeah. Uh, it'll be the best decision you've ever made. You'll look back on it in 20 years, in my experience. Yeah. yeah. I think going back to the timing the market thing too, I think it's like, I always hear this for people like, oh, I'm just gonna wait, right? And we kind of touched on this, but waiting isn't a plan, right? <laughs> and, and if you don't have a plan, your plan is to fail. 
right? Exactly right. You've got to have a strategy and a plan. And, and just what I find too is a lot of people that are complaining and waiting and the prices are too high and we're going to get a crash. The problem is if you dig a little deeper, which you can't, most of them don't have the spare 70 or 80 or $100,000 down payment. They definitely haven't talked to a bank yet or a mortgage broker to get pre-approved. It's difficult, as you know. You guys know. It's people seem to think it's a piece of cake to get a, a approved for a mortgage here, even if you've got the down payment. It's yeah. it's difficult. So try and get that. That should be priority number one for young people or young families is to get that down payment together, get qualified, try and get into your first place. It doesn't have to be a, a, a dream home. Just get your foot in the door with something you can afford, and, and uh, you know try and grow into for a little bit. Uh, keep saving your money and and once you're in the market at least now you're you know riding the market up it's not going to get away from you working your way up the property ladder exactly and then just do the cost of being on the sidelines that rent is really killing a lot of people I mean we're talking as I say in over five years a guy renting a typical one bed well over two hundred thousand dollars that's and that's after tax that's for nothing to show for it. It's a three hundred, you know, twenty thousand dollar a year income to make that money. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. And I, a lot of people, I don't think, fully calculate what it does cost to be on the sidelines. Interest rates would have to get up far higher than they are now before we would ever start that conversation again, where I rent and save the difference. Uh, that, that anything under eight or nine percent, it doesn't yeah. really make a lot of sense if you add it all in. Plus the intangibles, like you were saying, you guys were talking about that the intangibles of home ownership is not fearing that phone call from your landlord yeah. that, hey, we're going to sell the house or my daughter's going to move in. You've got two months to be out. It's just the stability and the comfort blanket that you get from home ownership. Yeah. All my clients at the first time, I work with lots of first time buyers and that's always what they tell me later on. It just took a huge burden off my shoulders from being a renter all these years to now owning. And just the pride of ownership, you can put some sweat equity into the property, fix it up, renovate it a bit. There's something special about home ownership that you, a lot of people don't realize until they finally buy a home. Yeah. And they realize that that $2,000 mortgage or $3,000 mortgage payment now, a lot of that is chipping off principal. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just going to their landlord down the drain. Yeah, what people don't understand is it may be on a month to month basis more expensive than the rent currently. If you if you factor in property taxes and heat, it definitely is. But if you take the interest portion away, you're you're, you're saving a ton of money, exactly. a ton of money. Exactly. And then the biggest, the only true tax shelter we get here in Canada still, and I think it's not it's not going anywhere. And that's that principal residence exemption. More millionaires have been minted by that than all other sources combined. That's how a great bit of my wealth has been created is by the principal residence exemption. You know, you buy a detached house, you keep it for 10 or 15 years, and you're up a million dollars on it. If you sold the house, that million dollars comes out completely tax-free. You know, you would have to create a $2 million RRSP portfolio to match that because the RRSP is going to be fully taxable when you, when you start drawing it down. So media doesn't pick up enough on that. The, the principal resident exemption, if that, that alone should, should have you absolutely possessed to get into your first home. <laughs> <laughs> it should, because the amounts that you can accumulate there tax-free are incredible over 10, 15, 20 years. Well, I think the argument people try to make, and I agree with this to an extent, but at the same time, if you're creative, it's it doesn't matter. But people say, well, all the equity I gained in my house, all of the other homes in the area have gone up in value as well, so it's fake equity, <laughs> yeah. right? But you can leverage that equity in the stock market. Yep. You don't You don't have to live here. What if you go to Calgary, right? Calgary did nothing for 15 years yep. while Vancouver literally just went on a complete bull run, right? Yep. Maybe you don't want to live in Calgary, but maybe buy an investment property there, right? Like there's tons of ways to leverage the equity within your home, That's right? Absolutely. You could, you could, you buy a detached house, let's say in Tawasson or something, and today for a million dollars, you sell it in 25 years for 2.5. Take that $2.5 million, put it into a, good dividend paying basket of Canadian equities like Bell Canada and the Canadian banks, you know, that's going to give you a, a about a hundred, well, let's say 5% yield. I mean, uh, yeah, it's going to pay you well in excess of $125,000 in dividends every year. That could rent, then if you want, just rent a place for, for <laughs> 3000 a month and you'd still have money to live off yeah. on retirement. 
So, yeah, I wouldn't buy that. Or, you know, I've got lots of clients over the years that they, they will retire and move to Kelowna or the interior where they can buy a house for half the price. Yeah. Take the, all the money from here and take their chips off the table and go someplace uh, less expensive. Yeah, there's tons of creative ways to leverage but that. E- even if free. everything else is going up, it's a lot better to stay on par with it than to just like <laughs> let it go away <laughs> with you. Like, exactly. You know? There's a lot of crazy ideas out there, but a lot of people don't really think through what they're saying sometimes and the cost of being on the sidelines and the tax advantages to owning. They, um, there's just a lot of moving parts for sure that you've got to you got to take into yeah. consideration. Yeah. So, uh, detached homes in Abbotsford are now down. I did the calculation yesterday: thirty percent benchmark pricing. Wow. Have you seen anything like this in in your career? Where do you see the market going in six months, and where do you think it's going in two years? I know that's three questions, but yeah. So I've heard these stories. So as you guys know, I don't really follow the Fraser Valley at all. Yeah. I really don't cross the bridge. I'm, I'm mostly in Vancouver. And how that's, is it over there? Is it- Vancouver is, is different. So we did not have those. We had a good run up in Detach on the east side, a house that was selling pre-COVID for one four, one five, probably got up to one nine or so. Uh, and they're off a, maybe five percent, I would say, for a D, uh, Vancouver special right now on the east side. Wow condos they didn't go up anywhere near what the detached did in downtown and they haven't really come off that much the one bedroom condo market in downtown vancouver right now is still quite strong for the high quality one beds it's still a seller's market and i'm still getting into multiple offers on my one bedroom condos so i had three sales last week um two in vancouver one in richmond all three went into multiple offers over asking price so it's something you don't hear on the news, yeah. right? Is that and is that like maybe not on your listings, but on other listings? Would you say that those listings were listed underneath what the perceived market they, value they was? Were, yeah, two of those were mine, and I priced them to get action, but not deliberately way low. No, right. The one, one the one I sold in 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 uh, Richmond was a new price per square foot high watermark for that strata. So they're out there. So I would say it's like anything with real estate, it's a tale of multiple markets. So just in a quick nutshell here, good high quality one bedrooms, one in Dan's in downtown Vancouver, Mount Pleasant, Kitsilano are as rare as hen's teeth. Now I'm talking about the good high quality stuff. So this is the really good strategy, yeah. good locations. This is the stuff that I'm getting a, yeah. most of my investors into. And a lot of times I'll wait for one of my preferred stratas. I probably got about 40 of them downtown. And I've got another 15 or so spread out through Olympic Village kits. Uh, Those are still uh, getting, a lot of those are getting multiple offers still. They're still selling pretty close to all-time price. As you move up the scale, though, into two beds, two bed under a million, it's off maybe 2 or 3%, I would say. But again, limited inventory. Yeah. But as you get into the luxury condo market in Coal Harbor for four or five million dollars, those are coming off uh, price-wise, maybe down ten percent. I would say inventory is building, but still not crazy. And you can come in and put an offer on those and negotiate it and get it, you know, fair bit below asking price. West side detached would be the same. East side a little bit to that extent, but not a lot of homes for sale. Now, I know when you get out to the Fraser Valley, things totally change because those had a massive spike from people moving out there from yeah. COVID. It drove the prices up through the roof, crazy bidding wars. I wasn't involved in any of that business, so I can't really speak on it. But in a way, it doesn't surprise me that now they're starting to come back down to earth. Um, I think some people, I've heard stories, they moved way out there, yet they still have ties to Vancouver, might have to go back to the office now yeah. and commute. That probably wasn't a great move there. Um, but, you know, I think those will be much harder hit. The outlying areas like the Langleys and the Abbotsfords and Chilliwacks, uh, as opposed to downtown Vancouver, especially the good quality one beds, they're almost bulletproof. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not saying that they can't go down in price. They've come off a little bit, but they are pretty insulated because they're in that s- sweet spot under yeah. 700 K. Uh, concrete, they're they're in high demand and not a lot of inventory. Hmm. That's crazy. Do you think there's going to be like, is there inventory coming? Like, what's gonna, what's it going to take for there to be more yeah. inventory? So I'm a little I, I tell you, I'm a little bit uh, surprised here. I thought that by now, here we are, mid October. I thought we have seen in, in, uh, inventory coming up a little bit here, but we are still well below where we should be for this time of year. 
as far as good quality one beds that I'm always working with investors on, I'm surprised. It's a trickle in supply. One here, one there a week. It is very low. I was expecting much more by this time. Where it'll go, I think inventory will continue to go up a bit more. It should. We're in our fall market. But that's what's keeping, at least in, all I can talk about here is, say, Vancouver, Richmond, Burnaby. Um, it's what's keeping the prices fairly stable here is because mm. there's just not a lot of inventory. Now, if inventory started to really go up, then you will see those prices starting to take a, take a nosedive down a bit more for sure. What would it take? Like, is that just forced selling? Yeah, that's the thing. You know, I think interest rates continuing to go up will will be a cold bucket of water. Every quarter point or half point rate will be another cold bucket of water. But I've brushed on this a lot of times in my blogs over the years. In Vancouver and Richmond, let's call Burnaby here as well, there seems to be some myth out there that there's a lot of homeowners that are heavily leveraged, over leveraged. And that's just not the case here. Um, you know, I sell probably in Vancouver and Richmond, let's call Burnaby in there too, probably 15 homes a year that I list that are clear title homes. They do not have any mortgage on them. I would say another wow. half of the homes I sell have at least 50% equity to, to loan value. Uh, so they're, they're, they're not over leveraged by any means. They've got a lot of yeah. equity in these homes. So, you know, I can't speak for some of these outlying areas where you can buy a detached home for, you know, half the price. Yeah. Uh, and there are definitely people that do get over leveraged. They're not usually from the big banks. They're these self-employed people where the TD or Royal won't uh, lend to them. So they go to a second or third tier lender at a bank much state, higher interest. Bank statement program. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. At a much higher rate. And they're paying kind of already pretty much loan sharking rates. Yeah. And as those go up, those people will be in some trouble. But they are the minority, especially in my market. I don't see those people in my market. And the other thing with Vancouver, everyone in, that I'm listing, and I'm privy to both sides. With On the buying side, I can count on one hand the number of buyers I've represented that are using high ratio the last 10 years. It's very few. Mm -hmm. Most are, and then my investors all have to put it at least 20 or 25% down. Yeah. And I'm kind of, I always try and get information on the listing side. I try and get as much as I can from that buying realtor. I want to know, you know what their current financing is like, if, if they just write in the contract, suitable, subject to suitable financing. I'm always wanting to know more. I want to know, is this yeah. high ratio? What are they putting down? And I can tell you that on vast majority of my condos, townhomes, all detached homes, of course, they're putting 25, 30% down on these homes. Yeah. But again, as you go further out, it's probably a little different story. I think I've had only maybe two or three that have been high ratio. Oh, I got, I got a lot just because it's a lot of first time buyers and stuff too, but is, getting, it, is it more like 10? Are they doing five? Five's getting pretty tough, I think, it's, right? It's, it's typically like around that in between five and 10% is what I see quite a bit because yeah. 20% for first time buyers is just like too much nowadays. Like yeah. if you're just getting in, you're, you're in your early 20s and you're trying to buy a $500,000 condo because that's what they're going for for in, in the nicer areas, then yeah, yeah 100 grand is just a little too much to say for most people. Some people have it. I've seen actually quite a few people that do actually have it. Um, other people have maybe around 10 and then their parents help them with 10. But like the people that are all on their own, um, it's typically like like in between 5 and 10%. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you see, my market's so different too. I mean, a lot of my buyers for downtown condos are a lot of young tech workers now. And these guys are, aren't getting any help from mommy and yeah. dad, that's for sure. These guys are pulling down 120, 130, 140. They've saved for the last four or five years. They're putting down 100 grand and they're, they're well qualified. Um, but that's just the downtown market. It's yeah. a different, total different league than even just from Rich Richmond. It's a much different demographic that's buying in Vancouver and that's kind of my main market. So we're a little more insulated from it for sure. Right. Um, I want you to kind of touch on this. I've heard you talk about this before. I think it's a really interesting concept. Pre-sales in Vancouver, they're like, what, like twenty, eighteen hundred dollars a square foot? Yeah. Really expensive, yeah. right? Why? Why is that? You know what I mean? Like, so yeah, you're talking about in downtown Vancouver, in and around downtown. Yeah, they're like yeah. over two thousand. I even saw one that was like thirty one hundred bucks a square foot. Oh yeah, foot. for sure. There's some stuff pushing now four thousand. That's going to be coming up on the Georgia corridor there. That I am uh, Stern building that they're going to put up on where the old white spot was. That's going to be, and then 1515 Georgia, which is a Boza project. They're well up over 3,000 a square foot on that building. Um, that's They're just starting to do the pre-sales on it now. So, yeah, I've blogged 
about this many times. The cavalry is not on the way, at least not for Van- downtown Vancouver. It's only going to be ultra luxury condos from this point on. Only ultra luxury. So everything is going to be starting at maybe 1800 and that'll be for a low floor facing the Smith rights in the back, in it'll the be like back a alley. It'll be bigger unit too. It'll be like a, you know, a 900, 1,000 square feet. Maybe. Yeah, although they tend to put kind of the smaller ones. Sometimes they'll put some little junior ones down at the bottom there. It's They're noisy. They're dark because it's in the alley. And those will be 1,800 a square foot. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, uh, and up. But the reason is, is that, um, you know, the land is incredibly expensive to secure. I mean, they're paying that white spot lot, I think, on Georgia Street, I think, was well over $100 million for that parcel of lot land. That's the one right by Stanley Park. Exactly. Right on Georgia, just pat, oh, wow. out, outside the entrance there. And then 1515, uh, I believe, is the address. Bose is marketing that. That's just up the street there on that Georgia corridor. Um, expensive pieces of land to buy to secure and even in the west end there's some stuff in on uh, Thurlow lots of stuff on Thurlow and Barclay Thurlow and Burnaby Street Thurlow and uh, and uh, 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 Harwood you know they're asking those those lots were you know taken out for you know 50 60 million dollars I believe for a pretty small parcel and they'll build a 35 40 story tower on there but it's expensive the, we've got a labor shortage here but developers aren't even really building much right now because of the all the things that are going on here. They're, they've all been delayed for years now, COVID, and now uh, with inflation running hot, the economy heading for a recession, interest rates going up, a labor shortage, uh, a shortage of material still, supply chain issues. It's it's going to be a coil spring effect. I, I heard uh, on the, the Vancouver Real Estate Podcast, which, by the way, terrible podcast. Don't listen to that one. Uh, they have uh, over 80 development projects on hold across the greater Vancouver board right now, I think, which is yeah. that's going to cause that coiled spring effect in a year, year and a half, two years when all these homes should have been coming to market, right? For, for sure. Business in Vancouver did a really good story and I did a blog on a couple blogs on this recently. These developers can't put together a pro forma now. So a pro forma is we secure the land for 80 million or 60 million. Okay, we got to hire an architect, hire a presale company, do our, our how many units are we going to put in, 200, our finishings. What do we need to, and then it's going to be four, well, we've got to run it through the NIMBYs and all the gauntlet of getting it all approved. And then in eight or nine years, you know, we'll, we'll build it in five years and turn over the keys in another four or five. What do we need to price it at now to go through all that? And they can't figure it out. It's just too, too many, too much risk. That? Yeah, exactly. With all the inflation and we're running into a recession and interest rates. So we're just going to just stay on the sidelines for, for a while here. And we'll wait till maybe some clearer, clearer skies. But again, uh, the other thing, of course, too, is that people should be aware of is something called an absorption rate. So all these developers, you know, they kind of work in cahoots a little bit with each other. Boza has this one. Ani, you've got this lot over here. They're, they can't uh, all build uh, luxury condos all at the same time and then put 5,000 of them out on the market in yeah. one shot. So what they'll do is they'll kind of trickle them in, uh, what they call an absorption rate, because... These are all going to be for m- only multi multi millionaires that are buying these units, and there's only so many multi millionaires to go around. Uh, yeah. So we've got to kind of slowly trickle in this supply because they're also competing against all the tangible product that's out there, and that's been building for the luxury market. There's there's a whole bunch of brand new or relatively new buildings in Cole Harbor. They're having a hard time selling them right now. Some of them are, are owners, and some of them are the developers that are still trying to sell these units at. 2,800 a square foot, and there's not a lot of buyers for those, plus the GST. Yeah. There's only so many luxury units the market can absorb at one time, mm-hmm. so why launch all of our projects at the same time if the market can't absorb it? Absolutely. Right? Just on pre-sales quickly, I've done a few blogs on this because there's a lot of young people, and pre-sales, that business has changed as an old-timer like myself here. I've bought pre-sales myself. I've also bought assignments myself for my own portfolio. The, diff, the business now is completely, the, the flip is completely scri- uh, flipped. It used to be 15, 18 years ago, there were some good deals to be had in pre-sale or as an assignment. Mm-hmm. Now, the developers about 10 or 12 years ago decided, hey, no more of this. We're going to move ev- the pendulum all the way over to our side now. So, and I'll tell you how it works. In the olden days, we'll call this 15 years, 18 years ago. I can give you some cases here. You know, you could go in and buy a t- pre-sale townhouse, let's call it, 
the price was almost at what tangible product was selling at, if you can believe it. You could buy it with 5% down only, no 20 like you need now, 5%. The time that you laid down the 5% deposit and, and signed the contract to the time you got the keys, in some cases was only a month or two. The thing was almost, almost complete, especially if you were buying wood frame townhomes, which I bought some. Um, so there was some good incentive to buy new. It wasn't that much more than tangible product. You, the turnaround time was very quick and you could buy it with 5%. And if you changed your mind on it, you could assign it and put it on the MLS and uh, a realtor could sell it. And, and you didn't, they weren't double dipping on the GST like they do now. Yeah. So today it's all the other way around. Now you need 20% down. So it's five, 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 and five over, call it 150 days or something. Uh, you're, it's selling in most cases well above what tangible product is selling at. I mean, isn't that, we're not comparing it to a 10 year old product. We could go at a look at a two year old yeah. concrete that I can get without GST, of course. The GST's yeah. already been absorbed that is selling below what this is. And this is pretty much new anyways. Nobody's barely lived in these units. They're two years old. Mm -hmm. The other thing, if you change your mind and try and do an assignment now on a pre-sale these days, watch out. Because the developer now has all the angles covered. They won't allow, A, they won't allow you to put it on the MLS. The, the reason they don't is because they don't want the competition. They now hold back units. Yeah. They're getting smarter and smarter. They only used to sell 100%. Then it got to 90. Now they might only sell 75. That's all they need to get the construction loan. And we'll hold the rest back. Hopefully the market continues to go up and we'll yeah. make more money on those. So if you have to get out of the deal and, and try and sell this unit as an assignment, you have very little hope. Uh, they won't once if they don't let you on the MLS. How are you going to sell it? Put it on Craigslist or something? That's what you got to do. <laughs> and good luck Based getting top dollar for it. Yeah. And the buyer, they're going to be smart. They're going to come in and lowball you. Why would I give you? And I've gone after some of these. Why am I going to pay you what you want on that? You're under the gun here. I know you're in trouble. I'll give you this amount. Take it or leave it, because I'm going to have to pay the GST as well on top of that. Or if you know somebody's going to have to pay it. Uh, there's also fees on top of that, a $5,000 assignment fee that never used to be around. Or even worse now, I mean, if there's some lift to be made or they do have some profit on it, you, a lot of times in the contract they want a percentage of that, ret of that profit. Mm -hmm. That was never around 10, 15 years ago. So people, I don't think, realize, new people to, to pre-sale don't realize how much that pendulum has shifted the other way. Now that said, I've often said in my blogs here, that doesn't mean never buy pre-sale. There are reasons that it can make sense for people to buy pre-sale. Every year I sell a couple where I'll represent the buyer on it. Maybe it's a, it's a building that he wants to be in because his office is just down the street or his parents live there or it's his home neighborhood where he knows. And maybe, hey, I'm living at home for another three years anyways. By the time it's completed, it'll be good timing for me. Then sure, no problem, it'll be okay. But I usually at least show my buyers let me show you a little bit of tangible product first before we pull the trigger on this pre-sale, just to make sure you understand and all the repercussions here. Once you sign on the dotted line with a developer, you are locked into this. There's no getting out. And if you couldn't complete on this, you're in real trouble. Yeah. Every year I get about four or five calls from desperate sellers. They're crying almost, saying, oh, and I need your help. I need you to list a pre-sale for me that I bought. Okay, well, give me some details. Can I put it on the MLS? No. Ooh. It's going to be tough. What I usually suggest to these people is do whatever you can to try and complete on this unit. So that means get your parents to co-sign or get a friend to co-sign or go in with a partner, whatever you can do. Complete on it, pay the GST, and then we'll sell it as a tangible unit. Now I can put it on the MLS, we can show it, we can stage it. You might still lose a little money, but the alternative is, is far worse. Yeah. But it's tough. <clears throat> It is tough. So that's awesome. What, uh, changing the subject now, what, what do you think, if you could boil it down to a few things, has made you successful in your life and career? Well, I think if, if you're in real estate, I think you have to have a passion for real estate. That's the first and foremost thing here in this business, for sure. You have to believe in the product you're selling. And if you don't have a passion and truly believe that what you're, what you're doing for your clients, is, you know, realtors in this province, we've got what's known as fiduciary duty, and it's the highest standard of care. You always have to, every time I'm working with a client on the buying or selling side, I'm always thinking about that. 
that I've got fiduciary duty to this client. I have to always act in their best interest. And a uh, realtor should always look at that. That's what the basis of my business has always been. But I also truly believe in the product. I think real estate can change people's lives f- for the better. It's the first step for most people. It's a huge financial hurdle in life once you can get into your first home. Hang on to it. I go against the grain of how I even make my money because I te- tell people buy, but try not to sell. And I make my money selling real estate. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to sell your home. I, a lot of times I'll get some investors after two or three years, they're up 50K or 80K. Hey, oh, maybe I should sell it. I try and talk, do everything I can to talk them out of it. Why do you want to sell it? You know, oh, I want to put the money into this or that. Why? You're going to have to pay the capital gains tax on it. You may not get back in. They keep tightening the mortgage rules. Why don't you just hang on to it? So you got to believe in the product. That's the first thing. If you've got a passion for real estate, helping people, then that's 50% of it. Um, the second thing is, of course, is we're in the sales business, and that's what real estate's about. I think that's uh, where a lot of realtors probably don't succeed. The bottom line is you have to be able to uh, give your, your, your clients good counsel, educate them on what they're doing, and you know walk them through all the steps of buying a home. It's a complicated yeah. s- process, but a good realtor who knows what they're doing or she's doing can make it look pretty easy. And that just comes with time. You get better as you go. No realtor starts off knowing at all, or I'm still at a point, even with the number of deals I've done, I still see things every month that is uh, I've never seen before in this business. And I have to consult either our legal counsel or, or our managing broker on some things here and there. It's a very complicated business and getting more com- more complicated all the time yeah. with all our requirements for FinTrack yeah. and disclosure. And it just it's getting very complicated. And they just tighten the, the mortgage rules. Like very recently too, so I don't know exactly what that's going to pertain yet, but um, that's coming. It is. Look at them. We got a cooling off period starting January first. Mr. Eby here announced now a flipping (laughs) tax that he wants to introduce next year. They want to make some changes to the Strata Act to um, override uh, rental restrictions for Strata. It just never ends. It's just one thing after another. You got to be on top of it, but. uh, and pretty much everything they do always seems to make the free market worse, except for maybe the stress test. It does. Was, well, was decent, if you guys have got a few, she said, I don't know if want for time, but this is for another topic, But I'll, and I'm going to do blogs on this, but I'm trying to back off on how much stuff I go after the government. I'm just getting tired. <laughs> it just never, it's a never-ending war. You guys, I'm hoping, I'm will kick the battle. Right yeah. yeah, then I'll have to give you guys some stuff to start talking more about because I'm starting to get, at my age, I'm starting to get worn out. But... The one with re, re, um, overriding the rental restrictions in Strata, this one is going to do a lot of damage to people. This is a typical NDP thing that they're pretending that this is going to help you when it's actually going to be make things much worse for people. So I have a number of Stratas that I've listed in in Richmond, Eastside, Vancouver, Mount Pleasant that are fantastic Stratas, but they have a rental restriction. No rentals or it's capped at a very low rate. So that's allowing, it's an advantage to young buyers, first time buyers, young families, because it gives them an opportunity to buy a good quality unit without having the competition of investors coming in and buying those units. By Mr. Eby claiming that, because he claims that, you know, young families are getting outbid by flippers, which doesn't exist. Investors do, but flippers is almost non-existent in this market and has been for a while. That's a different story. But... But he's doing the reverse here of what he thinks he's going to do. Now, these young families, are he's taking away the advantage that they have. Yeah. Because I'm not going to lie, I've got a pretty good database of investors. I'm selling a lot of uh, what's one of my major biz- part of my business. We're now going to be able to go after these high-quality units. And guess what? My investor clients have got deep pockets. There's no emotion involved in these sales with them. They're going to write subject-free offers with a bank draft attached and they're going to come in strong. And unfortunately, that's going to defeat a lot of these young first-time buyers. So I think they're making a big mistake with that uh, by doing that. But we'll see. He wants to push it through. And I think uh, people should realize that there's going to be some repercussions to that. It sounds like a good idea, but it's not going to be a good idea for, for young people that he's trying to help. Yeah. Well, it always seems like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <It> does. <laughs> All right. The big three. Where do you see yourself in five years? Five years, semi-retired in five years. 
So. Yeah, yeah. I think I uh, I've made some promises to my wife, and uh, that I think I love the business. I think I won't be fully retired, but I will probably in five years be semi-retired. Semi-retired for me will probably be doing you know twenty or twenty-five ends a year. Uh, Day trading on leverage? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Absolutely not. The reverse of that, just collecting my dividends and yeah. you know uh, and and uh, not doing too much. I don't spend much time on my portfolio at all. I just let it sit. And, and uh, reinvest the cash flows. But, uh, and yeah, probably uh, semi retired and probably spending, um, uh, love Vancouver, but I'll probably spend my winters in, uh, in, in the States, in the South, Hawaii, and California, and uh, enjoying, uh, enjoying life. I still enjoy life now. I've got a good lifestyle, but probably a little less work in five years for sure. If you weren't a real estate agent, what would you actually be? What would be your. Is, is a real estate agent your dream job or is there something else? I, I think it was pretty much my, I was I say, I was kind of born into real estate with my family. So it's always been a big part of my life since I was a little kid, you know, looking at listings with my dad and going to showings with him. And I don't know, there's, it, you're pretty much born into it. So but, you're living the dream already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I did, I was. I mean, I was, and my father, of course, too, was an incredible mentor to me as well. Yeah. That's a big advantage that I had as a, as a, and when I became a realtor, my first three or four years, I worked a fair bit under my father. Father, um, just learning the. I had a pretty good knowledge of real estate before I got licensed, but that was a huge leg up for me for sure. And I think if I wasn't in real estate, my other love would, you know, a couple of other things would be, you know, the stock market, investing, perhaps, you know, a, um, you know, a financial advisor of some sort. Um, you know, I'm still interested in that or something perhaps even in the fitness industry. I've, that's always been a big part of my life as well. You know, working out, staying in shape, maybe in the nutrition business or something like that. I see. I think sales, whatever it was, sales I've always been drawn to. You know, it's a it's a pretty incredible career. The, the, the thing that's always attracted me to sales is, is there's no ceiling on it. You know, the, yeah. uh, you could, the sky is the limit. You put in, uh, you'll get out what you put into yeah. it. Uh, you're, you're self-employed. You don't have to answer to anybody. Yeah. For a lot of young people, you know, if they're thinking about what to get into, you know, have a good look at a, a, a career in sales. Whatever that is, real estate, uh, finance, uh, financial sales, could be car sales, musical instruments, who knows? But... It's a, it's a, if, if you put the time into it, it can be very rewarding. Well, every product or service needs a salesman to sell it. Right? Absolutely. Or saleswoman. Sure. Yeah. And the, the last question we like to ask people, um, what are you most proud of? Uh, it's a hard <laughs> one. I would have to say, I'll, my wife is going to be listening to this perhaps. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but seriously, I think she's my better half. My wife. My wife is also a licensed realtor. He's, he's like, my book. Yeah. So I'm probably most <laughs> proud. Of, but I, I'm sincere about this, but I'm not, yeah. <laughs> but I am sincere about this. Probably, you know, uh, I got married fairly late in life, too. I've only been married now for 14 years. But my wife, that was probably the best, one of the best decisions I ever did. I was, the time was right to, be, to settle down. She's uh, been an incredible asset for me in my business. My, as a matter of fact, uh, not long after we got married, my business definitely took another pretty big leg up with her. And once I got her licensed, and um, she helps me a lot with the admin and a lot of computer work and things that she's very good at, that's not my strong suit. Yeah. I'm not a technical savvy guy at all nor do I have a whole lot of interest in learning a lot about it. I get by, but so it was, that was probably one of the things I'm most proud of is meeting my wife and making the good decision to, to uh, settle down with her. Yeah. That was that for a good, she'll like that too. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm no, being sincere awesome. about it. Yeah. yeah, no, that's awesome, man. I love it. it you know, it's, it's, it, it is. Uh, and, that's a common and, answer. And, my, and Miley. See, other, yeah, other, honestly, good. that's a common See, answer. They're smart, right? Yeah. Are you guys married or? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm so pretty, I'm only 23 years old. Yeah, then you are, you are pretty young to get, uh, yeah, I, I didn't get married till later, so I think, and you're not either, uh, Connor. Not yet. Anyways. Yeah, I'm still yeah. working on it. She's gonna be watching this. Too. Yeah, that's yeah, it. I'm still working on it. So that's good to know that I'm in other company. Other guys have said that too. Because I think, but I'm being sincere about it. I, I, it, it really is. A, it, when the time is right, it's a good move to make for sure. Yeah. yeah. For me, it was. Yeah. Well, relationships are work, right? People think they just seamlessly fall into place, but if you want to keep a good relationship with somebody, you have to work on it, right? So they are. It's some of the toughest uh, things to to keep going for sure. Yeah. Nobody's relationship. To keep them in good standing. It also gets yeah. to a point where if you're not in one, it, it's almost 
it's almost harder at that point because it's yeah. like like there's so much of an asset at a certain point that it's it's worth it's worth being in one yeah. rather than not. Yeah, that's it. Like even though it is work, it's yeah. worth being in one. Yeah, I think yes, I would agree. Every every sure. uh, great man has a great woman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some, some whatever that quote is. Yeah, right? there's some truth that if you pick the right woman though too, and that's the thing. Nothing wrong with taking your time until you do find the right the right absolutely. one that's important too that you don't rush into it i think absolutely yeah all right you have the floor what do you say to all the all the young cats out there that want to own you know a bunch of real estate in vancouver and and uh you know what, what do you what do you what do you say to somebody out there who wants to have great success and financial independence well yeah i, I my message as you guys know has never really changed over the last 25 or 30 years it's I would tell people, especially in this day and age, don't try and get successful or rich overnight or quick. I know you see guys buying the meme stocks and the Bitcoin and all that stuff. And if you want to dabble in some of that with a little bit of mad money, by all means do it. Especially if you're young, there's nothing wrong with buying a little bit of taking a flyer on a speculative stock or something like that. But do it with money that you can afford to lose. Overall, I would just take a slow, steady approach to to getting success, whether that's working up into a career or getting moving up this corporate ladder or whatever, or financially or, re, or saving for retirement, just take slow steps is the key is key to it. There's no shortcut to this. I would I always tell people your first step I think once you're out of school and you're working should be to save for the down payment to buy your principal residence. That should be your first step. If you've got credit card debt or anything like that, you can't start saving for a house until you've got that cleared. Once you have that, that should be your come hook or crook. You should be almost obsessed with getting into your first place, in my opinion. And again, start with a Motel 6. You can buy, there's condos right now on SkyTrain in Richmond, older wood frame stuff you can pick up for 325, 330. So if you can get in with 5% down, mm-hmm. we're talking $15,000, $20,000. Yeah, less, less than $20,000, yeah. $20,000, it will be, now you're in the market, you can put in some flooring, put it on Ikea kitchen over time. Now you're off to the races. Yeah, and currently, if you're if you're like debt free, that would be about seventy k a year. You would need to make to qualify for that. So that's not even that bad. So it's doable. Yeah, yeah. that's it. And I guess too, if, if you saved a little more, if you didn't have that, if you're only at fifty thousand, then if you saved maybe thirty or thirty five, yeah. you you can. Yeah, put it, more, it'll more it'll in. slowly kind of teeter. Yeah, on a yeah. scale there for sure. So that, and then I always tell people, you know, it, it, try and if you can, take advantage of the other, well, principal resident exemption and then your TFSA and your RSP. Start slowly putting a little bit of money into those things. The sooner you start, the better. If you can start in your 20s, it makes life so much easier by the time you get into your 40s and 50s. If you wait, there's all, you can just Google, you know, the cost of waiting and procrastinating, it'll kill you. You have to put in five times as much if you yeah. wait till you're in your 40s. So it becomes almost effortless if you can start early. Put a little money in the TFSA, and I tell people the best way to invest now, these are, there's so many things out there now that I could never dream that I had starting when I started investing 30 years ago. I mean, I used to get, investing in the stock market, I blogged about, I used to get ripped off into mutual funds. and I had a broker that was charging me $125 to buy shares. Now I trade for free or I pay $9.99 a trade. Young people today have got so many more advantages, especially when it comes to investing, than I would ever have dreamed of 20 years ago. But just index invest. That's the best thing. Vanguard, iShares, just put your money in the S&P 500 or the TSX, the XEI. That's all most people will need these days. It's not going to. Co- it'll cost you six basis points. Set it, put it away. Just keep putting money into it, and you'll do very well on those. You know, everyone should understand that. You know. If, Passive investing in, a, in an index fund will beat 90% of these guys you see on TV, these active managers that are telling you, put your money with us and we're going to buy this, sell that, hedge that. The dirty secret to that that I tell everyone about in my book is that these guys are, are lying to you. They, 90% of them are lagging the index every year. 
and that yet they're going to charge you one or two percent for the privilege. I think yeah. the funniest uh, one that I've seen is somebody did a video on like Jim Cramer, he, how he goes on yeah, CNBC. Yeah, yeah. The inverse Cramer now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Whatever he says, literally do the exact opposite. Yeah. Your chances of making money are like a hundred percent historically. <laughs> well, they started a new ETF with with the inverse Cramer. Whatever he did, you do the opposite. But you know, <laughs> Cramer, I've got mixed report. I mean, I've read a few of his books, and I I do like him only for his access to some CEOs. I mean, he brings on CEOs for interviews, but don't take your stock advice, yeah, from a guy, because he's a, he's a trader. And the only thing when these guys on TV I often talk about, they're entertainers. That's what they're there for. They're on TV to entertain you, so they have to tell you to do something, yeah. buy this, sell that, because otherwise they wouldn't have a show. If they just told you, put $50 or $100 every month into the S&P 500 and call it a day, that would be, <laughs> wouldn't be much of a show. No, and then the next day they tell you the same thing. Yeah. And then that's the end. The show was 10 seconds long. Yeah. But that would do far better. You would blow the, the returns away off just doing that as opposed to listening to these guys on CNBC and Bloomberg. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, that's awesome. so just take it slow, slow and, and steady. There's no quick way to get, uh, to get rich or get wealthy. Just the younger you start, the better. And it's uh, just keep it simple. Long game. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's awesome. All right. Well, I think we should wrap this up. Uh, really appreciate you coming on, Owen, man. You're really welcome. Good. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Thanks yeah. for having me, guys. Yeah, all right, guys. Lot. If you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, all of those things. Uh, same things on Spotify. We'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.